I to say. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Um, uh, friends, uh, welcome to um, the web talk on gender gaps uh, on the state of gender equal, uh, equality. Uh, today we are going to uh, talk on uh, girl child discrimination in India, examining and declining sex ratio. This is a program being um, uh, done by IMPRI, Impact and Policy Research Institute, um, New Delhi, and Gender Impact Studies Center of um, IMPRI as such. So uh, we have um, a very eminent um, you know, academician with us, uh, Dr. Bijalashmi Nanda, uh, who is the acting principal of Miranda House. I think uh, she needs no introduction. Um, you know, and uh, the topic that we have chosen today is something on which um, Bijalashmi has really worked uh, for last many years. She is a well-known uh, feminist academician. And, um, you know, um, in fact, uh, you know, I must share that um, uh, I have a book uh, of hers, a recent book of hers, uh, which I can just show if the cover will be shown further. It's called The Sex Selective Abortion in the State. And this was presented to me by uh, the late Dr. Meetu Khurana. And why it gets here, yeah, this book I'm talking about, why it gets more poignant is that uh, you know, um, today we don't have Mithu Karana, we lost her this year. And I begin uh, from the preface of the book where um, Dr. Bijalakshmi Nanda has quoted, um, you know, uh, Mithu, saying that more than seven years have passed since I stepped out to get justice from the courts of India. I was tortured and tormented by my husband and marital family for bearing daughters. I have, however, had the most bizarre response from the highest quarters. The bureaucracy, the doctors, and the judiciary feel that when a woman resorts to a legal recourse, she's actually misusing the law. We have Beti Bachao Beti Parhao, a flashy program of the Prime Minister, but when it comes to the crux of the protecting and promoting women and girls who are alive, there is a deficit of trust. I'm alive, and I saved my daughters by not allowing sex active abortion, sex determination of my fetuses were illegally done, and I was rejected and abundant for having daughters. But as long as I am alive and my daughters are alive, we are not the ideal victims. We will never be considered as the daughters of India who are to be saved. For that, we should first be dead. What prophetic words we had from Mithu, and she passed away this uh, 19th of March, 2020. And all the courts of uh, India, especially Delhi, the lower courts and uh, the high court and Supreme Court of India failed Mithu Karana. The first PCPNAT case in the country. And um, about who uh, Mithu, in fact, uh, uh, Bijayashmi Nanda has also done fantastic, uh, a thorough research. She spoke to uh, Mithu and got testimonies from her also. Maybe she will be sharing that as well. But the, prop, the, but the issue that, um, you know, uh, today Dr. Bijalakshmi Nanda is talking about is so relevant about the child sex ratio, the declining child sex ratio. And it's important that we discuss it today as one of the biggest gender gaps that's um, staring in our faces. Um, just to introduce uh, Dr. Bijalakshmi Nanda, uh, she's an, um, you know, acting principal uh, at Miranda House. She teaches political theory and gender studies in Miranda House, Delhi University. She is a feminist activist and researcher. She has provided consultancy to various UN bodies on gender issues and has extensively traveled world over in connection with her academic pursuits. She is widely published and some of her academic writings include co-authored Human Rights, Gender and Environment and co-edited Understanding Social Inequality, Concerns of Human Rights, Gender and Environment. Uh, her forthcoming co-edited book, Discourse on Rights in India, Debates and Dilemmas is under publication. So um, without taking much time, uh, we also have uh, Govind Ji with us. With us. So uh, before I just pass it on to uh, Dr. Vijayalakshmi Nanda, in fact, Govind Ji, uh, if you can also share a few things you know, about the importance of this topic, uh, because Govind Ji has been one uh, person who has been in the women's movement. I have seen uh, over the 80s, you know, since 80s actually, and she has uh, been our mentor as well. 
So Govindji, over to you, and then we'll have Bijalakshmi talking about it. Yeah, Govindji. Thank you for this brief introduction, very general yes, words. I'm good evening. You joined at very right time. <laughs> just <started. laughs> I was trying to figure out something, sorry, that in the meeting afterwards. So um, I would, I have not really worked on uh, in terms of the research, but what I have observed off and on, I work on discrimination in such. And I have looked at India and China with regard to when Amartya Sen wrote uh, uh, for the first time Missing Women, and that was the Human Development Report in the 90s. So we looked at who were these missing women. So that was the one thing that I, I was really intrigued by what is happening and to what extent the discrimination can go. Later, as the time went, I think we are all familiar with this, that um, the government survey shows that, uh, which I think Dr. Nanda will very well um, uh, illustrate, uh, that um, in 2015 and 17, the number of girls per thousand males declined to 896. From 898 in 2014 16 to 900 in 2013 15 so you can see the steady decline since the turn of the century in fact it is the recent data but if you look at since 21 1921 then you find the number has been declining so and haryana where uh, we are located it is kind of the worst performing state with the, all this kind of slogan of Beti Bada, uh, Bachao, what is it? Beti Padhao, Beti Bachao. That is the kind of uh, this thing. So, and other uh, fact that uh, really surprised me and still surprises that urban India is worse than rural, in, uh, rural India. So, with literacy, with economic well being, Things do not improve, as is the we have the, our common perception that it is the poverty that causes the problem, and if the parents are not poor, then things would be okay. <coughs> uh, India's sex ratio is worse than slightly uh, worse than I think uh, slightly better than China, but that doesn't no consolation and Pakistan. But uh, these are the two emerging economies in Asia and make a kind of headlines every now and then in IMF, World Bank, and look at the kind of women's ratio that is going. So it is not only the non-discrimination, decision-making, this and that, but physical elimination of the women. That is, that is cause of concern. Women are bought like cattle uh, for purposes of marriage, for purposes of future generation. I mean, India buys, for example, Haryana buys from Bihar, these anecdotal evidence they all suggest. China buys, was buying from Vietnam. So similar kind of situation. And then who is the more productive kind of uh, woman? So probably the uh, cost would be higher for the uh, girls from Kerala and Andhra Pradesh. And these are the poor women who bought and sold. So it is really the human rights abuse and the murders that in our civilized uh, uh, families that are nurturing families that are taking place or nurturing households. And that's why I have a serious critique of agreeing more with Engels when we say that family and, uh, and state has to wither away because of this kind of nature. Now the question is, what are the reasons? In my understanding, that uh, two things come up. First thing, uh, Education and technology has not helped us in this regard. It is the change in the gender norms that are going to help. So disempowerment of women. So that's why we talk of empowerment of women. Actually, the economic and non-economic disempowerment of women is the main reason for this kind of thing. In a very soft term, we say sun preference, and which is a fact also. But the question is the sun preference, as if they are in sun preference, do you eliminate hmm, the other, other sex? And of course, uh, it is not the binary of the sex we are talking about. If you go to the third gender, and that is the trans 
people, then there it is the worst kind of thing. But we are not talking about the trans people, how they are thrown out of their families, what happens and uh, so on and so forth. Um, that is, uh, so discrimination is one, right? Starting from the family and going in the society. Anti-female bias in our cultures and social norms. And these social norms are very kind of masculine. And uh, women are seen as the objects of pleasure. I mean, we are full with kind of every day, we read the paper and there is hardly any day which will not have the stories of rapes and gang rapes and attacks on women, killing of the wives, killing of uh, girls. Um, how they are subservient to men, but you have to be subservient to men, any woman, because if she wants to live in the house, she's quite resourceless. So studies on poverty, studies on housing also indicates that there is a rational in the getting rid of the female child. That is the, this rational, however inhuman may be, but it is very in economic terms, as I also see. They are resourceless, they are poor, unable to take care of parents, carry on the lineage, except in Meghalaya, where the girls carry the name and the land and the lineage in the family's name, which is a matrilineal society. Throughout India, even now in Kerala, it is the boys who would kind of carry the name of the family. And since carrying the name of the family is such a big thing has become the although these all these Delhi and South Delhi, which is the worst kind of affected, they are sitting in U US and UK. But the, even then notionally it is son, that son would carry the name of the family. So that's why daughters don't count. Patrilocal marriage. China once attempted, and that history taught me, uh, I mean, I've been a student of China's political economy, that um, when they tried to address at one time in early 70s, that question of uh, the treatment of the girls in their system, then they said, end the patrilocal marriage. Uh, a lot of problems start. And we see this problem in Meghalaya, in our state of Meghalaya, which is matrilineal which is not patrilocal marriage. Patrilocal marriage means the girl goes to the, after marriage to the husband's kind of place and where she has to adopt herself <coughs> in all the way as her home. And the real clash starts on that. They don't have any inheritance rights. Um, only change came in 2005, as late as 2005. And the poorly implemented, uh, very poor implementation of this law. Hindu Succession Amendment Act. So they are seen as the liability on the society. And that is that really, and you want to get rid of the liability and want to promote the, those who produce. So um, in economic and social norms, both combine against them. And then this inhuman practice develops. I will not really uh, talk but what um, long, but what bothers me is really, control on women's labor, body, sexuality in the male system. I grew up in a village in Uttar Pradesh. <coughs> and I remember my mother would say and justify, if a woman, a widowed woman or single woman got um, pregnant, then there were only two kind of uh, recourse for her. Either the family would kill her or she would be, she, would, she has to commit suicide. Uh, these things are still ring in my ears, kind of thing that how, what kind of control on the sexuality. Motherhood is the right of the woman. It's a natural right. But see how it is controlled. The reason I'm bringing the motherhood in order to see the control in this kind of control of the situation, how women are uh, and girls are eliminated. I think, I don't know what could help. I have spent all my life in education, but I find education really doesn't help much which is because what kind of education we get, that depends on that. I mean, sometimes we, we do get uh, trauma with the, these cases, which I got, I also learned from after education, unlearned the whole thing. But what we see in educated society and um, uh, particularly meeting the young people, young men in particular, who resist the sharing of the property like anything. These are the brothers who resist uh, the sharing of property with, the, uh, with sisters. So what would really help, first thing is the economic right. Right to housing, right to property. 
and the government and the policy are going in circles and not addressing the problem. They are only treat women as individuals when they have the right to vote. And uh, if it is, comes to the land question, if it comes to the property question, then everything gets into head of the household. And we know who is the head of the household. In social norms, in uh, poverty analysis, it is always the male who is the head of the household. Mobility, don't have the freedom. Why women can't talk, uh, can't walk at eight o'clock at the dark of the uh, night? Who they are afraid of? And who, the, uh, who is being protected by whom? It is the young men. I was discussing when, <coughs> this afternoon with my uh, research assistant that uh, uh, I said, are you, he says, I'm worried about my sister. Once she comes, I have to protect her. And she's working in Abu Dhabi. So I said, you are protecting your sister against whom? And then he thinks over it and he says, well, people like me. I mean that of my age, then he explained. And then he surprised, he got into this controversy. And I also discussed this often with my student. I said, we are not protecting them against animals. We are really protecting them with other so-called civilized people. So freedom of mobility is very, very important. The so-called the safest places for women. Freedom to grow and make decisions for young girls and older girls. Uh, thank you, Sylvie. And addressing social gender norms. This is the crux of the problem. The gendered norms and social norms or social gender norms or society gender norms really influence policies. And even if the policies are passed <coughs> or made, they are not implemented because this happens in our culture. What is this kind of mystified culture? And we are proud of our culture that makes us like this. So these are some of the things that are really could help in terms of curbing this kind of violence against, uh, which happens to a girl child, feticide, infanticide, I mean, all come for in the, in the age group of zero to six years is the worst thing that is for women. <coughs> Thank you. So I don't know what you wanted me to say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I think, but I thought I'll, uh, on a special yeah. question, we will go later. But Absolutely. I just wanted to share my thoughts on this. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Govindji. I think for sharing, um, you know, the entire issue comprehensively. Uh, so we would move now to uh, Dr. Bijalakshmi Nanda. And after that, of course, um, you know, we'll have other people joining us. Plus, the, you know, people who are watching this can pose the questions and all. So Dr. Bijalakshmi Nanda, over to you. For that generous introduction and also the introduction, the uh, the main ideas that were shared by Professor Kalkelkar. I think we have already set the tone for what we are going to discuss today. I would also like to thank the organizers, Dr. Arjun Kumar, Imprin. Now, what I am going to do now in the course of this discussion that we are going to put, uh, you know, in the next 20 minutes that I discuss. I'm going to also examine uh, the two things. One is looking at the policy environment, uh, not just of Beti Bacha, Beti Padha, because that is recent. But I think when you're looking at declining child sex ratio, we are looking at uh, an issue that has been there, uh, if I may say so, from the 1980s. So I'm going to be engaging a little bit of the historical context and looking at policy from a historical perspective, not just from a contemporary perspective. Historical meaning contemporary history, of course. So having said that, uh, along with you, Induji, and, uh, and our members here, I would like to dedicate this discussion to my dear friend. I would never call her late because she reverberates yes. in both of us to Mitu Kurana, to Dr. Mitu Kurana, and her beautiful daughters who are here with us as a part of her. I dedicate this to her. I dedicate it, dedicate everything that I'm saying to her because I've learned everything from her journey and her battle. It is sad that we have lost her, but we haven't lost what she gave us, which is that, that she is the first complainant under the PCPNDT Act. And she's a mother who saved her daughters, who was able to fight this battle with her marital family with all the forces that were against her and her daughters are now 15 years. So I think in a way it is a celebration of life. It's very sad that she's not here with us on this physical plane, but she continues to be with us forever. I hope till we are here. So in that light, I will go to my presentation. I hope you can see the presentation. 
can you sorry sorry i don't think uh, i'm sorry i'm sorry i think i need to share the screen yeah share the screen yes. yeah. uh, can you yes can you see it now yes 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 so what i'm going to look at what's wrong ma'am can you hear us vijayalakshmi i i hope you have not muted yourself vijayalakshmi i hope you not muted yourself you to unmute yourself to present it i think the video has froze sir ha huh? just give her a call right yeah 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 just yeah just yeah, give her a call yeah yeah she has got out i guess some internet issue oh my god oh technology at times you know can create all kinds of complications yeah but anyway i think you know uh yes is she back no i'll coordinate sir i think okay okay so yeah. kelkar can also give some uh on the topic rithika if you can bring on the screen no you know no i think one second one second what what i would want to do is you know i can just share here you know about uh, dr meetu khurana uh, you know okay. that uh, that right. both me and uh, bijalakshmi were very close to and um, for the last about uh, you know um 5 6 years you know that i was in touch with me too uh, you know um, and i must tell you that you know i think uh, she she fought the case she was totally dedicated and committed on this entire issue and as even dr bijalakshmi spoke about you know she saved her two daughters and the daughters today are 15 years old and imagine for these two daughters the mother is no more so she, they are with their grandparents with the maternal grandparents nana and nani and uh, you know uh, so it's it's a struggle for these two young two young girls very bright young girls you know um, and uh, and meetu used to tell us when she was there that indu ji i want to be alive for my daughters and what a tragedy that when it came you know to just being you know there she is no more and uh, due to certain medical uh, issues she had lots of complications and we lost her this year but she was one uh, person who was a fighter you know right from the lower courts to high court to supreme court i think uh, she kept filing cases and uh, we have lot of advocate friends who were supporting me too you know whether it was um, you know um, anu narula it was indra uni nayar uh, you know or whoever in fact we had one gone met one prashant bhushan uh, to take the matter to supreme court as such but uh, as it is i think you know we um, we are sorry to have uh, lost me too and i must i think many times she would say that indu ji please come to uh, the court and uh, you know i must share here that the way these uh, family court judges who are themselves women used to treat me too in the court she was unwell she couldn't walk properly but this judge would call her to the court and make her sit from morning till afternoon she had you know a drip in her hand and she was made to sit in the court so it, she actually when she is mentioning that she was tortured actually she was tortured by everybody by her family that is her husband's family by uh, the courts as such so in a way uh, you know what she mentioned that until mali is dead will not get justice i think uh, the sorry state of affairs in this country is that she is no more and uh, justice still is not been done to her and uh, but surely i think she uh, gives us the commitment to uh, take the entire issue ahead you know so we are not going to give in like that we have friends like bijal lakshmi and all i suppose you know i think that would be something which um, you know uh, i think empowers all of us to fight for these issues because these are our issues you know this is not one girl's issue or one woman's issue these are our issues you know against patriarchy so uh, so that is what i want to share use this opportunity you know until uh, bijal lakshmi joins us Arjun, any idea? Are we getting BJ Rakshmi at the moment? Um, uh, the 
thank you, sir. Yeah. Uh, maybe uh, I would like to just uh, pose a few quick, you know, comments uh, to what Professor Kelkar uh, just said in her opening remarks. In the yeah. meantime, if uh, Professor Nanda joins in, uh, ma'am, you said that. Um, uh, you know, uh, you mentioned about the declining child sex ratio. Okay. Okay. Uh, I think I have no problem. Okay. Okay. Go ahead. Go ahead, ma'am. I'll. Hold on. I'm in charge of the admission, so all the matter is, uh, you know. Yeah. So sorry. I'll just share my screen again. Yeah. 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 We lost you. Then we started just discussing about me too. I discussed about me too as such more in detail. Glad you did that because I think she needed that space. And not yes. to my presentation. No, 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 no. Presentation is crucial, you know. I think so. We'll talk about more about her later. Yeah. I'm trying to share the screen again, but I'm not able to. Where is my presentation now? Just, yeah. just one minute. Just one minute. Yeah, take I your time. time. Those. Yeah. Take your time. Take your time. Take your time. No issues. Huh? Yeah. Back to my screen. Actually, just a minute. Take a minute to open the screen and uh, if it okay. Uh, you, you if you have a problem, you can also maybe email it to uh, um, you know Arjun and all. I, I I was able to manage it fine. I just go back to it again and hear you. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, I'm, uh, I think now it's open. I'll go back. I'm sorry for taking this time. No, no, not an issue, Vijay Lakshmi. Not an issue. Okay. Uh, so I'll try to share the screen now. Uh, and uh, let me then. Okay. Yes, it's coming. Yes, come, come. It's come. Please go ahead now, Vijay Lakshmi. Please go ahead. So uh, I'm going to take you through kind of looking not just at policy, but looking at the dilemmas of feminist politics in dealing with policy, because I think that's important and uh, Professor Kelkan has already set the context. So I'll begin with what is very, very, you know, it's, it's something that all of us understand. One is that justice is hard. It demands our devotion as well as our understanding. For that reason, it must grip our emotions. We must feel its absence and presence with the depth of feelings that we associate with love. This is something that Joshua Kohan Cohen says. So while we are discussing about the declining child sex ratio, we are actually talking about families, like Professor Kelker very clearly said, this is not about son preference, but as Mary John and others have said, it is about daughter aversion. And then there is Maria Mais who said, in order to understand a thing, one must change it. But how would one change this? And while we are looking at beginning, I think from Amartya Sen talking about the 100 million missing women, we have, this is a cover of The Economist talking about what it say, calls gender side. What happened to 100 million baby girls, thereby referring to the declining child sex ratio in India. However, again, uh, there is something that we need to discuss here in terms of language, in terms of how feminist politics looks at the idea of gender side, why we need to engage with the concept, not just from the point of view of uh, violence, but for also from the point of view of discrimination. Why for me, discrimination is a very operative word here. Now, let us take a look uh, at sex ratios and there's, there's something about Madhya Pradesh here. This is just adult sex ratio that we are looking at. And clearly, I mean, uh, we are all aware this is the 2011 census. And that is the last census that has taken place. There would be one in 2021. But I believe that that would be it. Now, this is the sex ratio. And I am not using, you know, uh, the, the, uh, the statistics that have come about later, which is now. 2015-16 that uh, Professor Kelker was referring to, 
which is uh, which is about the SRV, the sex ratio at birth, or uh, or or I mean I mean they are showing decline very clearly. But this is the more uh, relevant data for us because the decadal census looks at the zero to six age group, thereby taking care of any forms of under enumeration, any kinds of other criticality that is there in the data. So you are looking at a decline which is nine nineteen in two thousand eleven. Now, having said that, there are many ways in which it has been referred to. You have talked about female feticide. We've talked about sex selective abortion. Some of us say uh, pre-birth elimination of females. Some say son preference. The others are saying daughter aversion. The terrain of the language, and uh, and many of us are, see it as gender bias, sex selection. That uh, we are looking at the disposability and the dispensability of women and girls even before they are born. And that is coming in from an attitude, not just of son preference, but of daughter aversion, and we need to engage with it closely. Now, uh, again, I think one of the things that Professor Kelkar has talked and Indu, you have also mentioned, is around the idea of the fact that women have control over their bodies and that reproductive rights is, are not just about giving birth. It is not just about motherhood but that there is a freedom of choice in reproductive matters and that it is essential for all of us, whatever gender we belong to, to map the course of one's life. Yet we still have uncertainty about it, you know, the way in which it goes around. Now, if you take a look at the state and global discourse, there is a discourse around this idea, the idea of sex selective abortion or, or gender discrimination in terms of, uh, uh, you know, in terms of the fact that girls are not even allowed to be born. That's the idea, right? The 100 million missing women, of course, for Amartya Sen, written in the 1990s, talked also about adults, adult women. You know, it talks about all the missing women in South Asia. But when we are looking at, uh, you know, in the present context, we are only looking at zero to six. And zero to six, we are therefore looking at what we call sex selection, which is that even before conception, you are using new reproductive technologies in order to bring about the preferred, uh, you know, uh, 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 the fertility choice or whatever is being made in, a, in an atmosphere of reproductive technologies intervention. So what has been the discourse? There is one discourse of equality, which you and I are talking about, that there should be no discrimination, there should be no violence, girls, boys, and any other gender should be treated equally or it is a question of, of uh, demography. And a demographic meaning that it is a question of correcting num numbers. And the global discourse, if you take a look back at the gender side, uh, you know, picture on the economist, that again looks at the idea of numbers. Then the other idea that, that is there in the state and global discourse is crime versus justice. Crime here refers to the fact that this is a criminal you know, act and the act of you know, terminating female fetuses even before they are born. And that is why it is necessary to see it from the point of view of law or is it about justice, substantive justice? Something that you, know, you and I, uh, Induji, have talked about, that this is about substantive justice, not just about the implementation of an act, but going beyond that. And then looking at whether it is a question of rights, whether bodily labor, uh, you know, work, whether right to property, all of those rights needs to be, or is it a question of ethics? Is it about just about the human rights uh, basis around, around the ideas of uh, ethics? So that is something that I'm doing now. Now here I look at the policy response continuum. Yes, there is a declining child sex ratio in India. The, the numbers we have, we have shown you in the zero to six coming to a 919, the lowest since uh, 1981 to present day. And you, you are also looking at maybe the 2021 or maybe 22 when we will get to know, will show us again lowering of numbers or perhaps improvement in certain areas because of certain policies. So what are the policies? One is you take a look at policy response continuum in two ways, a supply side and a demand side. The supply side is the presence of new reproductive technologies. And all of us are aware that these new reproductive technologies, whether it is cryonic villous biopsy which had come in, or it is ultrasound that is there presently, but they're mainly for health reasons in order to detect the you know, congenital abnormalities. But in India, the congenital abnormalities turned out to be that the fetus is female. And therein came in the act, the PNDT, the Prenatal Diagnostic Techniques Act, which later on is, uh, you know, got amended in 2000. This came out in 94. And then I think it 
Uh, it came into process in 96, but the PCPNDT Act came about in uh, 2002, three when, when preconception was added. So you were not only looking at sex selective abortion, but you were looking at uh, sex selection, which is that you were looking at, uh, at, at it at the preconception stage. So even that was added and the women's movement was active in this front and the state and uh, through a certain collaborative process, this particular law was given to us and the law is very much there and it is part of your Beti Bachao Beti Padhao the Beti Bachao Beti Padhao, which is a tri-ministerial, you know, kind of uh, uh, policy, uh, does have one which is the implementation of the PCPNDT Act, looking at girl-child education, and looking at the larger context of equal opportunities. The other part is the demand side. The supply side is coming in from doctors, from uh, from alternative medical practitioners, uh, or the business uh, the kind of you know the kind of corporate uh, you know bodies that are creating all these uh, technologies the demand side is coming in from families and that is the most disturbing thing because you are looking at gender discrimination no matter for how long we have been shouting it out from the rooftops that that this discrimination needs to end but it continues unabated so here you have uh, from you know the policy statements concerning women and girls, women's empowerment program schemes, financial incentive schemes. I'm not going to be talking on Beti Bacha, Beti Padhao, but the earlier schemes that had looked at it and other laws that exert. So this is how the policy response continuum has been. Again, I come to what is the feminist idea and uh, how do you engage with the idea of pregnancy and, and how pregnancy or the reproductive body has been seen for, for feminists, for others to kind of look at. And this idea that, that in fact, what is considered to be most natural, most, uh, you know, this is a struggle that women have had, that how you look at, matin, uh, you know, the maternal healthcare crisis in India, where you look at how women have to survive their own pregnancies and what are the various issues related to that and we can open up that in the discussion that takes place but that is a very important part now i take a look at how does the policy look at women and how has been the state's gaze at women uh, looking at some things that rajeshwari sundarajan and others have done that the state uh, if you take a look at the policies and laws either it is about them being litigants or supplicants or them being activists or them being victims or they are beneficiaries so that is how they have seen it. Now, what has been the feminist engagement with the state? One is that the feminists, when they have worked on issues around declining child sex ratio, it is in the 1980s when violence against women was seen, this was one of the major kind of campaigns. You looked at confrontationist ways of doing it. So you had your protests, you had your questions that were being raised, or you had a reformist way where they worked closely uh, with the state in order to reform, in order to engage with finding a way forward, or it was a cooperative one where you kind of uh, looked at uh, the issues uh, which, uh, which we could do together, the law being one. The law came in not just by the state directly, but by the civil society and others. Then a collaborationist approach, and these were the ways in which we moved forward. Now there came in the dilemmas of feminist politics. One is, should we go with a law or should we go outside the law when it comes to declining child sex ratio? And since this is the engagement that the policy uh, uh, center that you have here, research is around that. Whether it should be a pro-life discourse or whether it should be a pro-choice discourse, whether women should be seen as active agents or passive victims, whether we should look at monetary incentives or whether we should look at a rights-based approach, whether it should be within the state policy within that or should we look at uh, resolutions outside the state and these are some of the dilemmas that feminist politics uh, has looked at the first dilemma is with or law or outside the law some feminists emphasize on the creation of laws while others believe laws may themselves become a site of gender discrimination since they reinforce power relations and may increase bureaucratic control and you do have people like Agnes, uh, Flavia Agnes, uh, Ratna Kapoor, Menon talking about it. Now, uh, this is a very important learning and I, I'm going to open it up later on when we have a discussion, uh, it, a more in-depth way that how do you look at the law and whether the law has helped us and I will come to Mithu's case when I do that. The other is whether we should look about approach life or approach choice. 
Now, when you take a look at, uh, you know, every time there, are, there is a discussion around uh, sex selective abortion or, or around declining child sex ratio, you, there, is, there are various competitions, uh, which is the order of the day that you ask young people to reflect on it. Most of the time, these are the kind of uh, presentations that come in. So it is almost as if uh, it, is, it, it is a pro-life discourse and the mother is pitted against the child. So if you take a look at some of the presentations here, it is more or less around a very, very pro-life. And here I'm not using pro-life in terms of, uh, you know, in the way it has been hijacked, because I agree that all of us are pro-life. But in the way it is seen, the fetal life against the women's life and whether it should be a pro-choice discourse. And this is a very important understanding that we need to develop. Because many times uh, this is what leads to a problem when it comes to feminist politics, because feminist politics has engaged with this issue from a pro-choice perspective, where it has looked at women's rights to reproductive, uh, you know, in a, in a reproductive way to look at empowered and informed choices. And it is not just about fetal rights, but the right of the girl child to be born and not seeing women and girls as binaries seeing them in a, in a continuum, looking at the life cycle approach. So a gender discrimination beginning from birth and right down you know, to death. That is the kind of continuum that you're looking at. So that kind of a life cycle approach is, is very, very important. And most of this is a very, very you know, significant dilemma that we need to look at. This is an experiment, and I think it's important for some of us to look at this. This was Nawaz Shahar. In, the ninth, in 2001, it was the worst sex ratio. It, was, it had the worst sex ratio in Punjab. And this is Krishna Kumar, who was the then, uh, you know, the deputy commissioner or the, or, or, you know, like the collector, district collector, as you would say. And he was running a very, very important, very strong campaign there in order to bring about a certain change in the declining child sex ratio. However, you know, most people felt that what he did was that he started monitoring pregnancies of women, which led to pressures on them and it hampered their privacy. And uh, there was a whole lot of pressures on the families in which if it was found out that for some reason certain abortions had taken place, and this led to an element of coercion, fear, it limited rights of women without really, I mean, he, he did this with a missionary zeal. He, was, he, he did it with great enthusiasm, but somewhere, the message went out to the community in a different sort of way, and this led to a problem. To be fair, it was one of the most proactive uh, you know, campaign, and it did bring about a change in the statistics that happened, and he moved away to, to other posts, and then that particular campaign died. However, you know, the sustainability is, becomes an issue of great campaigns. At the same time, when it comes to policies, there is always a delicate balance that needs to be done between fetal rights and women's rights. That's an important one. The, this third dilemma, and this is where I bring in Meetu, is whether women should be seen as active agents or they are passive victims of this particular you know, phenomenon where you know, the child sex ratio is, is being. So this is Meetu, my dear friend. Uh, Meetu, as some of us here know, was a doctor who had two twin daughters. She was forced by her family, her marital family, to go in for uh, sex uh, determination and then for sex selective abortion. Uh, and she refused to all of that. She moved out and she moved in back to her natal family. She was able to protect her daughters and she was able to fight with the law, with, which this was much, I think it was much earlier, the 2000, uh, early 2000s, uh, when she, I think 2005, 2006, when she started. But, and we were all hoping that she would get justice. However, that did not happen. And this was a very long journey. And, uh, you know, she continued, she lodged a complaint, but, but what was happening is it was not just about the law, which was very carefully made. It was a comprehensive piece of legislation, but implementing authorities, you know, the bureaucratic, uh, uh, the system that that is there, they were, they also have the same mindset and that mindset comes from society. So there was that problem that always occurred. And we had to engage with a number of authorities where it was very difficult for us to explain because the first thing they would say is her daughters are alive. What's the problem? She should just get back with her husband. The fact that this discrimination had happened to her and that it needed to be looked at from the point of view of the PCPNDT Act, which actually talks against sex determination, that somehow seemed to miss, uh, you know, in, in the judicial 
kind of understanding that was that was missing out and it was very difficult many times mithu had become an authority on the law herself and she would engage with the legal system and tell them and we received a lot of discrimination at every level so this was something that i thought i should in the right set now the other dilemma is that uh, in the early times not with beti bachao beti padha but at the early early times when 2001 and 2011 uh, the main thing that used to happen is that you started bringing about a lot of monetary incentives uh, and the monetary incentives uh, ladli lakshmi these were the kind of incentives that were there and the, they were actually conditional cash transfers where you gave out a particular cash transfer to the families by thereby you know kind of trying to increase the value of the girl child through that and uh, it it was seen you know the, the conditional cash transfer taken from you know mexico and uh, brazil and other places progressa bolsa familia was basically to boost human and social capital but in india we had so many and i'm just going to run you through the slides and you can take a look at it later however the problem with this is that i mean whether it would really bring about and whether it would enhance the daughter's uh, worth and uh, i think there was a there's a interesting statement by john dres where he said that uh, you know by paying families to keep their daughters maybe we are reinforcing stereotypes that they are liabilities then again since i did a study of the ladli scheme uh, one found out that it did not really change much at the very end and we need to look at inclusion and exclusion and how do you engage with that and i'll quickly do that Uh, here clearly so we looked at aspirations for uh, for education or marriage and uh, when we asked the beneficiaries they said many of them said that we would send it because you know by 18 years they would get that particular scheme the ladli scheme and uh, they said that we would spend it on us on our weddings and that became one of the things and many many of these schemes actually get, came to be called the hate schemes and my study revealed that uh, sex selective abortion or gender bias sex selection was happening having a ladli ladli scheme or having a certain 1 lakh of that scheme that led to some of them uh, you know weighing it and they looked at the second born daughter but it started weakening in the next order and uh, it was not addressing the core issues of gender discrimination and there was also this idea among even amongst the young girls that the only time we are going to be celebrated is our marriage and we they did see it as a significant marker of status and self worth and while some tra cash transfer brought in a sense of security their bargaining power the increased voice within community did not happen now i come to the fifth dilemma should we go with the state or without the state should we only try to find solutions within you know and here in i bring in the case study of the two child norm this is my study of odisha so here in odisha there was a two child norm for the panchayati raj and uh, uh, women who were trying to participate always found themselves outside uh, uh, you know they were not able to enter into the panchayati raj system because of this imposition of the two child norm some of you may know it and here i am using a case study of a lady there called bimala she and her husband were very active with local issues but she was not able to participate or uh, contest for the local elections because she the state had a two child norm and uh, that two child norm uh, made it difficult for her to do so and she did raise some questions that i have three daughters but i am being penalized and many studies have been done to show that these kind of norms work against women's women's rights to participate in panchayati raj and other places because it leads either to rejection and abandonment of women because they are part of uh, that particular you know they are already in that uh, age when when they have already had children and uh, larger families or uh, or and the and the men who want to participate would rather not be associated or it leads to sex selective abortion they would rather you know uh, have two two sons or, or or one daughter one son and then this is how it impacts so this is also something that the state this kind of a you know the contradiction between two kinds of policies one policy which says let us improve the sex ratio another policy which uh, which uh, brings about an imposition of a coercive population policy that leads to that acts to the detriment of women and girls now i come to the last bit of what i'm going to talk here so what should we do then if this is how it is what are the ways in which we can engage and i'm going through and these are of course theoretical uh, perspectives but i'm looking at how do you link bring about a linkage with rights and entitlements do you look at capabilities approach 
Do you need to look at social protection with broader development efforts? And something that, you know, do we need to look at intersectionality? Or a kind of a, you know, the feminist uh, dilemmas, can we come together on one point and then move backwards? So that, that's something that I can... Now, this is something that the UNFP has, uh, has given us, uh, where they say that you need to look at assets. The three A's of tackling daughter aversion. Assets, where you women can earn, they can own, they can inherit, so you can look at property rights, you can look at policies that improve their financial standing, employment, tax, credit, all of it. Or you could enhance their autonomy, you look at their power, their choices, safety, mobility, all of that. Another area which, you know, places like you mentioned, uh, China, of course, but the two, the one child norm there worked so badly against uh, and to the detriment of women and girls. So in South Korea, they were able to turn it around because they looked at access to social protection for women, how children cannot be the only source of support and whether the policy response should be to ensure social care. And this is a very important, uh, you know, significant debate that needs to be part of the policy discourse presently. So what do we need to do? Of course, now if you take a look at the Beti Bachao, Beti Padhao, uh, you know, campaign or, or the program, it very much, it has come in with, with some of the contradictions that we had noted with the Ladli scheme. It does bring about a tri ministerial, you know, kind of a, there's no compartmentalization. We are looking at health. We are looking at all the various resources that are there, whether it's education, not so much to employability, but really engaging with all of that. So how do you, you know, look at it. So you need to go forward. You need to have social protection uh, schemes, which should have a look at a proactive role of the state and realize also that the state may not always be a benevolent representative of public good. We can also struggle for what our uh, needs are, how do you allocate that, and how the marginalized can raise these questions of inclusion. And uh, it's not to st stop with the state whether it should also look at the non-Western cultures only and say that, oh, it is only India. And that's why I have a problem with the economist, uh, you know, uh, kind of a uh, thing by saying that these missing women are all from India or from South Asia, that uh, whether we need to look at it at, as a transactional cycles of gender vulnerability, because new reproductive technologies are not coming from India. They are also coming from all over the world. The US, for example, has played a major role in bringing about a lot of, a lot of new reproductive technologies. So has China, so has you know, different places where they have been, and also big corporate giants, even Google and others have played a role in this. So how do you look at this? Is it not everyone's responsibility to see to it that women and girls are not discriminated at any level. And this is not a cultural context only. And we need to look beyond that. And how do you look beyond that is a question that we need to, uh, you know, uh, talk about. And uh, these are my, you know, generic statements. And I have tried to bring together all that is there to the dilemmas of feminist politics. I can in the question, because it's, it's a, it's a longish thing. I don't want to talk anymore but if there is a question around the the distinction two distinctions that i want to point out one is the the binary distinction between save the girl child and not engaging with women's rights that's number one number two engaging with the idea of uh, sex selection and and abortion because the dilemma of feminist politics on this issue, why they have moved away. Induji, why you, I, and a group of us are still talking about sex selective abortion. Why Neetu on, on the, on, on a, on, in a large way did not receive the kind of support that she was mm. looking for. What is that dilemma? It is, it is definitely a dilemma. But how do you engage with that? These are some of the things that we need to look at. That it is very difficult for for the for feminist politics to work on sex selective abortion because there is an overlap over the right to abortion. But herein, I'm going to end with this. We look at what Gayatri Spivak says, strategic essentialism, where we may disagree and it is a heterogeneous group, the women's movement in India. But we should agree on one thing that any kind of an abortion which is gender discriminatory, whether it is for any reason, that should not be allowed. And we should all agree that women's rights over their bodies include the fact that there should not be any sex selection or gender biased sex selection. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Bijalakshmi Nanda for this excellent uh, presentation on something which was so poignantly 
um, involving all of us in the struggle. And um, you know, uh, I just before I open it for discussion, I want to bring to your notice also uh, the conversation I had with my mother. I asked her once uh, that, "Mummy, just tell me in your times, how did you, how did you all practice female infanticide?" I asked her, and then she tells me, "You know that there was this plant in which you pluck the leaves, and that white uh, juice comes out." So she, she says, "When the girl is to be born, we used to put the juice in her uh, mouth." So she's talking about the, you know, the women elders in the house, you know, in the family, and then they would say, "You know that, uh, you know, uh, uh, they would tell the girl." In Bhojpuri, aage ja tu, piche bhaiya ke bheja. That you please go now and send uh, a brother. I, you know, and also we have Atharva Veda which says, grant here a boy, girl somewhere else. So, so this thing, you know, we're talking about sex selective abortion and discrimination is actually value loaded. It's been there for centuries. And you mentioned about the data and the politics and the polemics and the dilemmas, I think so brilliantly. Uh, you know, uh, so um, as I open the discussion, uh, you know, I would uh, rather say if there are some friends like Simi and all who want to contribute to it. And um, towards the end, we'll have surely Govindji also come in. And uh, so and I, I think I'll open it for discussion now and we'll come back to it later. Uh, Arjun? But I think... Uh... If Professor Kelkar is there, yes, because she had to go somewhere, ma'am. Okay, sure, sure. We, we can have her. Sure, we can have her comments and then we open it for discussion. Yeah, go in, ma'am. If you are there, no, not an issue. Add to it. Huh? So, I think you can go. Then, then Ritika uh, Anshula Punya is also here. Uh, let us select all the sir. We can have club the questions. Then I think uh, yes. Dr. Nanda yes. can answer. Right. Yes, yes. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Nanda and uh, Dr. Indu Prakash for setting the tone of uh, uh, the session. And um, during your presentation, ma'am, and uh, during uh, Indu sir's uh, initial remarks, uh, I literally had uh, chills uh, and uh, I could feel the, you know, the pain and uh, the entire passionate uh, arguments that you are trying to bring in. Um, I don't know. Uh, until when can we see a fulfilled society where uh, the crimes as um, uh, female infanticide and female feticide, uh, it is uh, totally eradicated from this planet. Um, I am optimistic, but uh, I, I really want to see this during my lifetime. Uh, let's see where we go. Uh, Ma'am, uh, so uh, when you say that child sex ratio is declining, uh, you know, for for over a period of time. It is a pattern now. Uh, but we have also committed ourselves to the attainment of SDGs. Uh, and one of the SDGs also says that protection of uh, rights of women and equality and uh, one of the targets says, uh, you know, uh, child sex ratio, balanced child sex ratio, etc, etc. So if we have committed, on, uh, uh, committed to this attainment on the one hand, um, and we are still uh, experiencing a decline in child sex ratio, do you think that we are being too aspirational? Um, and uh, in this, uh, this further has uh, in its implications in the, on the global gender index, you know, um, overall, because uh, as children grow up and then it is incorporated into this index. Uh, would, ch would change in gender norms itself suffice? Would this, uh, which gender norms, which uh, Professor Kelker had mentioned in the beginning, would it be uh, sufficient enough? Or uh, what is the way forward? And uh, ma'am, one more thing. Uh, in the US, there is a continuous uh, movement about you know right uh, right to a female's own body uh, right to women for her on her own body and in fact it is one of the election agenda also uh, in this time uh, do you do you think that in india we are at least fortunate enough or may uh, correct me if i am wrong i want to be uh, corrected that uh, in india there is no such political stand which opposes uh, this um, right to female's body. In fact, uh, it has all the political parties have the societal uh, influences, of course, but politically, at least we are um, uh, fortunate vis-a-vis uh, -vis the United States. 
so this is my initial few remarks and my questions ma'am um do you want me to answer you first or uh, uh, i think we can we can take the questions uh, or comments uh, together if you yes, sir yes. is it okay yeah. yes 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 arjun can you lay out the questions please yes ritika yeah. i think ritika Rit acha ritika Ritika, sir, we please. also have Punia. Punia is a student at TIS. She will also ask. But okay. Ritika yeah, and yeah. Anj Anshula, yes. Then I will. I will call it. Ed. Yeah, sure, sure. Okay. Please go ahead. Hello, hi, ma'am. This was a very good presentation. My question to you is: We are having population regulation bill in this country, which was presented in this uh, recent session of Parliament also. Uh, i just want to know your thoughts on this bill and what effect this bill will post for women especially and on sex selective abortions yes uh, anshula and uh, followed by punya anshula your uh, thoughts and or your questions anshula are you there Okay, Punya, you can turn on your video and I'll go ahead and ask a question, please. Punya, you are on my, you are on mute. Please ah. unmute. Ah yes. Uh, good, uh, yeah. So uh, good evening. Um, it was a really in uh, insightful uh, session, Professor Ananda, and I had a few questions. Uh, so the first one is. that when you uh, when you uh, explained about how we have to look beyond the state and uh, you know it is essential for uh, big corporations or uh, like how you mentioned that google has to come into place or other big corporations has helped so my question is that uh, if at all um, women do actually you know uh, if at all the the processes and if at all the women know all kinds of stuff and do women uh, know about the autonomy of their rights um this is first question and the second question uh, is uh, i'm sorry if it's not uh, if it's not well uh, asked and the uh, and the second question is that um, like uh, most often we think Uh, of state as a masculine uh, way of exercising power so when we uh, when you said that uh, you know um, like looking uh, at the state so how proactive like uh, is the role of state in the ground um, i hope uh, i could explain my question thank you i hope i won't forget those questions i i want to remember them all and answer them <laughs> Yeah, 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 yeah. Ma'am, in that case, ma'am, in that case, if you want to answer now, you can. Yeah, because they are very, very significant questions, very well formulated by a set of scholars who I think are working on the issues, uh, and uh, so therefore I'll I'll go first with uh, Simi's uh, points, Sir Doctor Simi Mehta's points, uh, where uh, I think we were looking at the larger context of uh, of one is of course I did try to find a certain. uh you know kind of a way forward if i may say so that there is a way forward and we can engage with assets with with kind of looking at how we can enhance women's rights especially right to property right to other kinds of rights that we are talking about but uh, is the state uh, uh, yes also the us uh, now it's a very interesting book that is written by sital kalantri where she studied uh, and i don't know how many of you have looked at her work where she looked at uh, sex uh, the discourse around sex selection in the us and she said that they made uh, sex determination a crime for in certain states for uh, south asian community by saying that uh, they are culturally in a in a context of sun preference and therefore they should not be allowed and kalantri raises that as a question because she says well yes there is a certain sun preference or daughter aversion in india or in china and we can engage with that but there is no evidence to show that uh, that this is impacting the population which is there in the us and and also whether the us needs to look closely at its at its own patriarchal regressive policies around abortion 
and and it is important that they should study that is why i say that you know you need to look at the trans transnational cycles of vulnerability women's body is in india it, you know where pro choice becomes anti women because you have gender bias sex selection in the us it is just not getting giving them the right to abortion having said that uh, uh, you know are we are we a more uh, we are progressive are we liberal i mean yes definitely there has been some engagement of women's movements with the state leading to a uh, a uh, uh, limited medical right to abortion to medical abortion but some of our medical abortion laws the medical termination of pregnancy act 1971 the trajectory was not so much about women's rights it was about the population uh, you know control so it it the, the fact is that uh, in order to give out a certain way of family planning it was felt that abortion should be made liberal so that is from where the trajectory came so we did have abortion a limited medical right to abortion which came in through the trajectory of a population you know control kind of a lobby but this is not to say that it is not it is not there for us and this is why the feminist struck the women's movements in india always want to keep it separate so the mtp act of 1971 and the pndt act of 1994 96 and now of course 2000 the amendments with the pcp ndt both of them have been kept separate and there has been no overlap over the right to abortion there in i must say that the indian state in that sense has been in some sense uh, neutral enough fragmented enough to allow the voices to come to so there has been some form of democratic whatever it is i mean there is all we always label the state uh, you know all blame at the at the door of the state but i would say 1970s or or even later on in the 1990s or the 2000s or even now i mean i must say with the prime minister coming and uh, and on right uh, it's talking about beti bachao beti padhao for that matter making it his flagship campaign there is a certain approach uh, that i must say is is a supportive one it is a proactive one but having said that you know we always think the state is about the policy the policy in india whatever policies whether you take a look at the justice varma committee report or you take a look at all the laws that have been made over time the pcp ndt act again i said a comprehensive piece of legislation in our space looking at women's agency engaging with everything that is there india is a legal paradise but ultimately what do we face we face problems at the level of individual mindset and that mindset could be that of the bureaucrat it could be that of the judge it could be that of a teacher it could be that of a policy maker somewhere we have not been able to separate that the the frameworks and you are very correct to say that why why can't we see this this is such an amazing i mean when you talk about child care leave to any american they will tell you my god you have it's such a liberal policy but it is at that level that we need so the the laws have come in but the societal readiness and when i say societal readiness or the policy readiness even among so there is there is a need for a gender sensitive training for policy makers also especially for bureaucrats who are carrying out the law we place all everything at the doorstep of the politician or the minister but i have faced and largely in mithu's case we have faced it from uh, from the middle ranking bureaucrats we have faced it from lower courts uh, judges so you know and and lawyers so it is at that level or doctors you know it is at that level that one needs a larger engagement and somewhere it is not seen as uh, uh, you know it is not seen as interesting enough or it is not seen as saleable enough to discuss all this because this is the mindset that needs to change that kind of a ideological consciousness which is there in the bureaucrats who are actually implementing the law if that comes about i would say that that would be and yes i agree with you that in the us the right to control over one's body is about their regressive laws on abortion and india definitely has a much better much uh, more uh, you can say a, a kind of a liberal right to abortion uh, we of course need greater access to safe abortion and we also need uh, need to have uh, uh, have a uh, you know need to separate it and look at uh, you know gender discrimination especially when it is sex selective abortion that cannot happen but of course abortion right women's control like i think i think menon perhaps says that uh, uh, in a perfect world there would be no abortion but it, this is not a perfect world it's an imperfect world where women have no control over their bodies therefore they need 
to have abortion as a choice and until you have unmet uh, you know uh, unmet uh, kind of choice needs unmet needs for reproduction uh, for uh, for family planning for fertility control until then this is needed and it is the choice of the woman but these are the questions that i think i hope i have answered your question then to the next question from ritika is it ritika so ritika your questions uh, the first set of questions around sustainable development goals was that the question no uh, it's about population regulation bill population regulation bill is a private member bill and i think it is being it's not it has not come in from a larger lobby it's a private member bill and i think uh, a number of uh, civil society agencies are already looking at it and they are engaging with it because like i said we need to look at these contradictions that uh, and th those contradictions need to be clearly laid down that whether it is empowering whether it will actually or is it just about numbers so the distinction between demographic which is like just correcting numbers or substantive justice why in mithu's case we always failed because somewhere they saw her as as you know the strong woman she's a doctor she has she has all the money she was not fitting into the poster girl of of a victim that was a problem because her daughters were alive she was alive and now that she is gone there is no story again because the story is over she died not not nobody murdered her but you don't see what happened to her she was victimized she was a survivor but being a survivor you don't fit into the mold of being being rescued and that's a problem that uh, we always and, and it like you know it right at the beginning she told me she says maybe when i die but i i if i could tell her i would say even after death there is no answer to this because how do you look at these contradictions the fact is it's only you see a person as a victim only after a particular kind of a horrifying crime happens but you don't really see the subtle forms of discrimination that happens throughout your lives and this is where we need to bring in more empowering policy so i think the private member bill that has come up population regulation that is being looked at very clearly and they were going to examine the contradictions i don't think uh, i'm really worried about that but yes uh, along with that we need to look at the gender norms i think those were simi's questions around gender norms and sustainable development are we being too aspirational of course we are being aspirational we should be what else can we be i mean of course female infanticide let me tell you happened only in a certain pocket but now you are looking at uh, because this is such a sanitized crime a uh, sex selection or sex selective abortion in sex selection there is no death also there is no murder so to say I, in sex selective abortion also we don't see it as murder it is not murder it is a sanitized crime so when you are looking at a sanitized crime then it has spread everywhere you are also seeing some some of it in uh, tribal regions where earlier there was no sun preference because of this uh, where uh, where uh, uh, supply is propelling demand i think it's the murphy's law in economics where supply the supply of new reproductive technologies we will get a scan to your home and we will find out whether you are going to you know then you know and abortion can be an indigenous method so this is also an area that need to be looked at the nexus between capitalist patriarchy global capitalist patriarchy not just global capitalist patriarchy and a sun preference so areas like in orissa i have we had not seen any female infanticide but sex selection happened now look at the numbers look at the numbers in places like you know, never expected odisha west bengal assam to show or nagaland to show us declining child sex ratio so this is the way in which you need to look at it punya's questions uh, punya could you just uh, there were two very important questions but just revisit it again just kind of remind me uh, the um, two yes 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 Uh, so uh, the first question is that uh, uh, when you uh, talk about we have to look at the state and we have to uh, you know uh, the proactive role of state. So uh, I uh, wanted to ask that how often does the state function in a masculine way uh, in order to you know for a woman's uh, right or for a woman's body or how how often does a state do that? efficiently that's my first question and uh, my second question is that um one second uh, so uh, when you also said that we have we go beyond the state so um i wanted to ask uh, that most often when we go beyond the state so there are big corporations and um, like yeah 
Yeah, I got that. I got that. And now I remembered. I'm sorry, I didn't jot down. I'm trying to toggle it with my admission process in uh, the college. So I'm sorry about that. So uh, what uh, uh, the first question that you are asking is, is that, uh, you know, the, the engagement that is there with the state. Now, I would li not like to say this is a very, this is the radical feminist position. The state is male and that the gaze of the state is male. Uh, but I would say the state is neutral in every sense of the term. It is neutral, uh, but it is dominant. It, it, it will reflect the dominant gaze. It will reflect the dominant gaze and the dominant gaze uh, whether masculinist or, or, or uh, uh, I wouldn't say it's patriarchal, but whether uh, it will reflect what the society feels about women. So women are litigants, they are supplicants, they are, they are beneficiaries, not in a bad sort of way, but you know, in a welfareist mode, women and child development. It's always that, right? It is, it is a question of seeing women as beneficiaries. So the state has engaged with women in different ways. So when you do not fit into that, when you don't fit into any of those roles, then you will be seen as disorderly. You will not fit into that story. And that is what happened with Mithu Kurana. She didn't fit into the story of what, what the gaze is. And I would see when I say the state, I don't mean the particular government or anybody. At, it could be the state in a, not in a monolith, but in, in the way in which we understand the state from a political theory perspective, a government, a governmentality of Foucault. So that is how you understand it. Wherever there is a power element, whether it is in the state or it is in an educational institution or it is in a tiny school or a hamlet somewhere, that particular gaze is the same. So she didn't fit. So you don't fit in. So that gaze will remain until and unless there is far more gender sensitivity, far more gender awareness. And that has to be at every level. So just like governmentality is flowing in the capillaries, you know, how power is flowing in the capillaries. That is how equality has to flow. Whether that is possible or not, I see that within, within certain movements. I see that in certain policymakers. And we have seen some very good bureaucrats who have carried forward very good policies also. We have seen Justice Verma committee report. Can't get better than that, that kind of a wonderful report. Or for that matter, the Beti Bacha, Beti Padhao campaign, which is also, you know, you could say it, it looks like it could have been made by, by a feminist for that matter, in the way in which it is structured. So I wouldn't say, I mean, one has to also move away from reductionist approaches about the state. And it's important why we critique to move away from reductionist approaches. So that's my answer to you. So I wouldn't say the state is male. That's a very radical feminist approach. I would say that the state reflects the power structures which are present in the, so for the state to reflect equality, it's, it's a huge, huge kind of, you know, that kind of a democratic decentralization, that kind of an equality principle, non-hierarchical systems, even in your own little circle of, uh, let's say, even in an NGO, there is so much power relationships. You can't say it's not there. Or even within within the most uh, the most beautiful of movements, there are there are power relationships. So how do you engage with power is the question, and that is what we need to look at. We need to do, look at more non-hierarchical systems. It's going to take some time. But I don't think that makes it any less worthy, that struggle. We need to keep that. So that is my answer. And the second uh, point that you have raised is about the corporate sectors. Now, again, any corporate sector is not here for a social responsibility. Social responsibility is an add-on. It's like add gender and stir. They're here for profit. So the struggle with Google for advertising sex selection, it was there on their ads took place uh, with Sabu George as one of the litigants and they were able to, I think, move, remove those ads. So continuous pressure uh, from lobbies who are, uh, who believe in equal rights. Uh, you can call them feminists. You can, there are many who may not want to be called a feminist. It, they are all welcome. Larger umbrella is necessary, but corporate sectors are going to think of profit, but how are you going to make them more gender sensitive and friendly is our business and uh, new reproductive technologies have come in from the US. Uh, they have all come in and they, in Korea and other places have made them so efficacious. You are not finding the same things for COVID, but you found that for sex selective abortion, imagine. So look at the way in which the market is also free. You know, the, like I said, demand has propelled supply in Orissa. Let me tell you, Induji, in Orissa, there was never any female infanticide. 
बट विथ सेक्स सिलेक्शन विथ दिस काइंड ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी जब कैमरा से फोटो ले लो पता चल जाता है सन प्रेफरेंस इज यूनिवर्सल इन इंडिया so now that there is a sanitized thing these uh, middlemen would come to homes and they would be able to select uh, you know tell you that okay you are going this is the female fetus and then that's it that's the end of the story that that is the end. uh then then you are definitely looking at a market a huge market and it is globally ordered that is why i find it problematic when uh, when the us makes uh, you know start stigmatizing south asian community for being uh you know culturally backward or being gender insensitive because part of it is coming from there and i am going to stop here but i would recommend you to read a, a book written by amin malof uh amin malof is a lebanese writer he wrote, wrote a book called the first century after beatrice it is about this uh, sex selective it is about sex selection about how something that is uh, you know made in a consumerist capitalist market and then it is used Uh, in a south asian context and how that changes the sex ratio of the world so there are more uh, men masculinized uh, populations on one side of the globe and uh, and and women on another side and how violence then occurs so somebody did i think uh, somebody uh, it was dr arun kerketa or somebody who asked what are the consequences of declining child sex ratio one of the consequence of course is that you have missing women and uh, more violent societies and also that one uh, the uh, for the fact that there are lesser women in one part of the country you are actually buying women from another part of the country so you know you uh, a daughter is dis uh, discriminated and eliminated and a bride is bought so like madhya pradesh and other parts you have women chatisgarh odisha brought to haryana or uh, or other parts of uh, where there, there is a declining child sex ratio no women to marry so called so how that also continues to impact women uh, in both ways the consequences are great violence against women uh, but yes a larger consequence on the society i don't want to use it as in a utilitarian way because we don't need women just because they are men need to marry them that's not the question we need women have a constitutional right to be born and to have a life of their choice that's the only reason why they should be there it's equal right so yes in that sense and also it's an ethical question it's an ethical question and that needs to be looked at yes i hope that answers all the questions that i asked that were asked yes yes right yes, i think yeah yeah can you sir can anshula also quickly ask a question anshula you can go first Right. Yes. Yeah. Uh, so, uh, mine, mine is a more general sort of question. And when we are looking in terms of the way forward, we we are trying to map out the way forward for this. Are there any um, lessons that we can learn from other developing countries in how they are uh, tackling uh, sex selective abortions or girl child discrimination and uh, Uh, a second part to this question would be uh, when we are trying to tackle this in india what uh, difference would there be in the approaches we take for uh, different actors of the society as policy makers as the general population as corporations etc and within the population also what difference would there be in the approach uh, in terms of say rural and urban areas or segments of the population that are disparate in terms of their economic situation I I'll just pick up on the rural and urban. See earlier on. Should I also, ma'am? Should I also add just for the time? Yes. I also have some because I uh, I also uh, work on urban studies. So uh, let me first congratulate for a very insightful, despite some glitches, but quickly we have been able to do this. All thanks to Indu sir, and uh, ma'am. I really wanted to flag some of the issues from the policy and data point of view, which. Uh, Uh, i have been researching all my our team has been researching uh, what uh, we have uh, found that there are also differences in chi uh, in child sex ratio especially pertaining to villages uh, small towns and you know then the big towns of course in villages the the child sex ratio is good uh, and uh, and also the normal sex ratio is also good because many of the male migrants you know they migrate to the cities and and hence in you know in 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 
in cities the sex ratio is skewed uh, but uh, the problem really gets very accentuated when we look at the same uh, from the terms from the terms of a child sex ratio and uh, other thing which we found we did some human development study in Dad dadra nagar haveli many states there we found that when we followed that where it is happening then we found that the abortion is not happening in the same city or let us say the same area uh, so people are uh, uh, really i would say very forthcoming for this selection but they are also changing and you know switching places and and doing that uh, other than that uh, i really wanted to have two 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 important uh, uh, things that uh, uh, the administrative data also all the des directorate of economics and statistics be it any state government uh, or union territory uh, are now very vigil or especially on the account of imr and mmr uh, so and on so for that uh, we as a researcher we have had many meetings and they report that uh, they report that that the Uh, the numbers are really good in the in the, in their databases and they they say that they track each and every cases of search for imr mmr what what has been your experience what would you like to add on this part and how this glitch can be uh, can be really plugged one last question ma'am uh, really uh, united kingdom and some european nations have uh, really relaxed their laws pertaining to abortion especially uh, given this pandemic in india you know the our debate is so so at the very initial stages that it has not matured uh, so what do you think uh, should be but especially that is required in in our urban spaces advanced spaces especially in delhi and other places what do you think should happen uh, going forward toward these laws and and what what can be the levers or tools that that gives teeth to to these kind of our laws or schemes or policy towards this should it be economic should it be uh, uh, incentivized or should it be counseling what it should be so that uh, uh, especially we have some control over that effective control i think i would stop here ma'am you can choose the question in the interest of time yes thank you once again i don't know whether i have answers for all of them but they are very nonetheless they are very intelligent questions very academically and very nuanced questions but i don't know whether i have many nuanced answers to that so anshula uh, your questions around the fact that uh, you know uh, uh, which is the countries that we can learn from definitely south korea especially its importance not just on the implementation of gender bias sex selection the laws but also looking at um, uh, senior citizens care looking at uh, social security uh, and then moving away from this idea that the children will be the bearer you know they will be the respon they will be responsible for their parents a large um, uh, one of the reasons that that keeps coming up as as a reason for son preference and daughter aversion not so much daughter aversion but son preference is that the sons do take care of their parents and the answer to that always is that daughters are better caregivers but that should not be the answer the answer should be to say that relationship between parents and children should be one of mutual reciprocity and love and there should be social care and security and all of that that can make their lives better that everyone should be supported and south korea has done that and that led to a difference in their sex ratio there was a turn around in in an, an improvement in their sex ratio they were as bad as us but they have improved so i would say that that is a learning whether we can look at aging as a major way the other ways in which south korea and uh, mostly south korea because the turnaround is mostly there but if you look within india also you'll find some examples as to things that have improved i mean of course punjab and haryana were the worst 2001 uh, census but by 2011 they improved because they had been given that distinction of being the worst state so they were dubbed they were questioned so they did try to improve and therein they brought in implementation of the law and certain bureaucrats did work very hard to bring about a certain uh, emphasis on girl child education and girl child health so that that led to some changes some kind and also there was a lot of promotion around this issue so i would say some of these things have helped but how should we proceed with it one is that i don't think there is enough awareness and i think there is not enough awareness even on beti bachao beti padhao Uh, I have to look at this because most people think that it is about just girl child education and i my studies and i will again link it up with the question that you asked lately i am doing a ics sat study with a group of us where we are looking at uh, gender discrimination from declining care sex ratio and violence against women we noticed that the beti bachao beti padhao campaign 
has led to a certain improvement in the emphasis on girl child education there is a lot of emphasis on girl child education there is certain there's something to be said about it and it does uh, but there is again a lot of focus on the fact that the girl has to prove herself worthy there's a focus it's not an entitlement your life your right to life is not an entitlement so the societal understanding of this of beti bachao is that you have to since hum aapko padha rahe hain to aap acche se padho nahi to aapka worth nahi hai so this whole idea of how women are seen as utilitarian you know in so seen from a utilitarian perspective even girls so i could see that that is also a burden on the girl child every girl child whether she is an achiever or not has a right to life so how the society understands it is a different so that social readiness who is going to bridge that gap you can't expect the policy makers to do that and that is where in education plays a major role so whether within the education within the policies we can talk a little more about gender equality talk about changing norms whether everything can be engaged with and also improvement you know bringing about uh, women into non stereotypical understanding let's say mathematics science looking at stem uh, girls and women in stem can we encourage more of that so engaging with that and looking at at and engaging with men and boys so i mean it can't really start with sex selective abortion it has to start uh, from other things it has to start with attitudinal you know mindsets attitudes how do you engage with that so if if uh, and also another thing that is coming up uh, both to both your questions is insecurity about girls if all that you are reading about is this anguish about how women and girls are being raped or they are being there's so much of violence against them parents can really interpret it as if the world is unsafe for girls how do you engage with that mindset whether you need to separate the crime discourse from the equal opportunity discourse that yes there is a crime discourse there is violence against women that is coming in from a societal and how rape you know especially violence rape how that is to be engaged with but also looking at it from equal opportunities one of the larger data that we need to look at is not so i mean i i do i have all sympathy and empathy for the fact that there is great violence against women but also what one needs to engage with there is women need to i mean they are not showing up in the workforce participation we are looking at very low indicators there and that is where we should also emphasize and they are not separate the more women there are in the workforce the more women there are in the public spaces the more there is there is a critical mass uh, thing and there is more participation of women both in the panchayati raj or in the parliament you bring about a more equal society and that will start reflecting also on violence uh, in 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 reducing it or on sex selective abortion so you can't really separate that you know we'll save the girl child like we are saving the tigers that's not the idea the idea is that the girl child grows up to be a woman and like mary john always says that we are not afraid of that little pigtail girl we are afraid of the woman or we see her that woman as a as a liability because we have to protect her some i think somebody did say you know i i don't remember who but somebody started with that that you know the i think was it professor kelkert who talked about the brother you know or was it you induji about the brother being protective about the sister so mm-hmm. how do you ha uh, i think professor kelkert talked about yes. it so how do you engage with that and that's very important that we engage with some of these issues uh, i mean it is it is a paradox to have so many great laws it is a paradox that some of the more economically prosperous states especially the urban areas uh, and families which have all the resources in the world continue to be gender discriminatory having the highest uh, you know number of uh, you know having the lowest sex ratio in those regions but you know what has happened now because of the advent of new reproductive technologies and also because of the aspirations of uh, the rural areas to be like the urban areas you are also seeing that uh, divide which was also that, that the villages you know had a better or the rural areas had a better sex ratio even that is coming down in punjab there is not much distinction between rural and urban anymore because motorable roads more aspirations uh, you know like an upwardly mobile aspiration to have smaller families and smaller families ka matlab hai let us get rid of the girl child she is most dispensable most disposable so why not have smaller families and i believe there was a study again by a dear friend who's also not here anymore uh, dr manmohan sharma uh, who's from the volunteer yes. association punjab there are many villages in punjab where everybody had only one son in the family 
so they didn't even want a second son so the small family norm was acting in such a way that uh, sex selection and yes if there is implementation of the law in certain areas more stringent then they move to the neighboring areas for abortion like i always say abortion is an indigenous method they will find their own ways of doing it also it is sex selection that needs to be stopped and now alternative medical practitioners are also offering it not to say that they have they don't offer good things they offer a lot of very good things to us and i have i'm i'm all in belief in alternative medical practices coming in from indigenous knowledge but it should not be gender discriminatory and that's a question that should be raised uh, i i don't know whether i answered all your questions but i tried to uh, and uh, in terms of the urban divide and also the rural you know breaking it down do take a look it has it has come since 2011 to to now uh 2000 from 2001 to 2011 that gap is, has decreased they are they are they are learning uh, the new the practices of the urban areas and that widespread uh, you know roads have been made so so you know with with modernization even these uh, gender discriminatory practices have moved there so and small family norms also at the cost of the girl child while we should have small families for for a uh, in coming in through uh, you know an equal understanding of what family life should be not pressurizing the women for more child births and not bringing about maternal mortality or infant mortality it should not be again at the cost of the girl child not through gender bias sex selection and this is where we need to engage yes thank you thank you ma'am i think that one thing which i keep on saying that uh, because all these measures you know uh, our governments have been taking for several decades now it's not uh, just uh, uh, we really at impri want to focus that uh, women really should have equal partnership in market uh, not just you know just the sarkari or government job uh, but really in market all sphere uh, uh, then only this thing can be you know eliminated for once and all okay. and education and property rights these yes, are the and um, even property, property, property rights, rights. Yes, yes. and and yes. and collective ownership like not every family has property to pass on so we should encourage more collective ownership of yes. uh, of uh, property of farms i mean bina agarwal has written about it and uh, so i don't want to you know no, i ma'am i work on housing but what i see that in assets when women have it is also for name sake that many example from bihar and other places do come that in panchayat uh, a woman is the sarpanch lekin sarpanch sar se ja ke milna hai yeah panchpati sarpanchpati panchpati yes yes even then i would say that let them yes yes let them come in let it at least be in their name there is something to even those titles i yes, know people keep keeping it but my point is let it be there at least in some ways you are acknowledging so hmm. that mentality will continue but some of these women came forward and did some great things also if you take yes, a look yes. at maharashtra rajasthan slowly and steadily they moved out of their shadows and that is there for a lot of political people who come into power they come in with the support of someone but later on they so we somehow see it in a gender stereotype sarpanch pati but i would again say that her biggest resource is her spouse so she is probably they are trying to do it but maybe it is still a space to be explored i know i am not saying it it's a very no. not stereotypical way of saying it but i think power sharing Uh, even in terms of just titling, but yes, you are right. I also did a lot of study around housing, and I noticed that although joint titles were provided, it was still seen as the man's house. It was never seen as the woman's house, but still he had that. Uh, it was still there on that paper, uh, and it is it is an important. Uh, you know, these are things that will take very long. Not in our, my lifetime now. I realize, uh, you know, but uh, yet again. Uh, in in all your all your lifestyle i know lifetime i'm sure there will be changes there have been some changes and yes there is improvement in places like mahindragarh for example there's been some improvement i did take a look at the latest census and they are reporting but until the uh, census reports come in i cannot comment on the data because uh, how much of that is reliable data we will only find out when the census comes in so i i haven't i mean i am not going to give out but yes i do know that it is no longer uh, i mean certain things have changed but what has changed 
we i still can't capture that but yes the importance to girl child education is there more emphasis on employment and i agree with you it cannot just be state employment public employment but looking at the market encouraging the market to employ more women and seeing how what are the ways to do it that could be one and uh, aging looking at aging uh, as a first aging both women and men and uh, engaging at at the education level look bringing about greater equality within the understanding within the education curriculum these are the things that we need and also medical ethics medical curriculum needs to look at engineering curriculum that's why i think stem is important that it has to be within science technology engineering mathematics these sciences have to become more gendered they have in there has to be more understanding you and i social science we have been doing it but somewhere we are not able to make the impact till it goes there so uh, yeah i mean these are some of the engagements but uh, i think uh, uh, we we have to keep on engaging right ma'am we did a very very big uh, conference for on stem education i will share you the link many partners across the world were there with uh, texas university uh, last week and uh, we also did uh, yes did a study of, on the atal tinkering lab of the niti ayog uh, so we interviewed many schools uh, within delhi uh, many girls were also there but ma'am you are right uh, uh, very less girls were there uh, in our study also field it is also it's very so I, i mean i think we need to bring about a more uh, transdisciplinary course around stem so stem it should be s t e m s meaning that social science along with mm-hmm. so not yeah. separating so stem i think that's how it should be till you make it stem it's not going to work mm-hmm. so my thing would be that and uh, yeah I, i think and again i would say that uh, while i'm looking at induji i i i'm going to say that i again i would dedicate this whole discussion to mitu and we hope to make the world a better place for her daughters and uh, that's our commitment to this presentation Thank Absolutely, you. Uh, Dr. Vijaya. In fact, um, you know, as as we come to the close of this uh, web talk, I just want to share here that you know how um, one of my I think kids, uh, you know, um, parents, we used to uh, stay at the bus stop, you know, to pick the kids and all. And she was a gynecologist, and she told me that you know um, that uh, uh, in the place that she used to practice in a community health uh, service. Um, Uh, she said she came across uh, one um, a lady and uh, you know uh, who wanted to do this test and they refused uh, finally she had a daughter who was born and she was crying a lot that you know well in fact ladki leke kaise karungi and all that two days later she came and uh, told that this girl uh, passed away and then she told this girl ki kya kiya tum logo ne she said wo kya karti mere saas ne maar diya usko jo she said if that was the case you could have given the daughter to me i would have at least you know taken care of her and she said induji such a beautiful child it was so so the issue is and then this was in south delhi so what also happens is like you know in terms of sex ratio and all i i you know i think we don't have the data as of now still but if you compare to delhi in delhi at least maybe the south delhi might be having one of the most adverse sex ratios compared to other parts of delhi as such you know so these are some burning issues some burning problems and in fact we had some fascinating discussion uh, with dr vijay lakshmi nanda and uh, i think the best way to end this um, web talk would be from her own book uh, that is sex health abortion and the state the last uh, paragraphs of the book uh, which says that uh, so can the effective implementation of beti bachao beti padhao with its emphasis on the pcp entity act and education of girls bring an improvement in countering sex health abortion i believe it can provided there is a critical connection of dots with combating dowry ensuring women's right to property housing land ownership and removing gender insensitive elements from all existing government programs and policies uh, well i think it goes on but but the last i think uh, two lines is very important i think for the talk that we had today the last two lines is that sex ratio is an indicator of the status of women and the status of women is an indicator of the state of the country and the time to act therefore is now so i suppose you know it will be a right tribute in the memory of um, dr meetu khurana to carry on with this struggle i know meetu is not there but in spirit she is there to guide us 
Uh, well, we miss Mitu. We love you. And we know that you'll be guiding us in this work. And uh, talk, uh, thank you, Dr. Vijay Lakshminanda, for being with us in this very, very crucial talk. And uh, I can just say Zindabad for sharing this important uh, you know, session with us. Thank you. Thank you, Indra, sir. Thank you, uh, Professor Nanda, for uh, uh, sharing your thoughts on such uh, short notice. Uh, really exciting. And we will share uh, uh, all the events deliberation with you over WhatsApp. Uh, if anyone will try to reach out, Indu sir, I will connect them with you and Professor Nanda. Yeah, uh, sure. Thank you. Sure. Yes. And have a nice evening. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks a lot.